You've got for to do a software discussion at three thirty. So it'll be left. Jamie and Alex are probably going to present. Uh, will you be here and listening? Because I think you're an important player in this field and okay. what you'll have a discussion. Uh, if, it's, if it's, you can't make it at 3.30, we can also reschedule it for tomorrow or something. Is it yeah. okay to say something else? Okay. But the, is the point is that I say something here to everybody who's here? Is it a small group or big group? It'll be whoever wants to show up, but it looks like it'll be quite big. Yeah, There's so lots of people interested in this topic. So Jamie and Alex are going to say a bit about Globular and Quantumatic and what already exists. And then perhaps you can talk about what you're building and then there will be a general discussion about how to set out yeah. the requirements and make sure proper collaboration and standards. Yeah, I'll think of it. Cool. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, one wants to go to more <laughs> discussion. That's the only problem. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks very much, Matt. and uh, thanks to all the organizers for, uh, for inviting me. They also left me to my own uh, uh, sort of to choose freely what I would talk about. Um, and I'm actually going to talk about applying, indeed applying category theory, I think in a novel way, uh, within computer science. Uh, it might seem surprising because uh, to those of you coming from other subjects, because we sort of, as we heard, Computer science is the first area where, which saw substantial applications of category theory going all the way back to the early 1970s, in fact. Um, so we might think, you might think then that, that sort of applying category theory in computer science was a done deal, but this is actually very far from the case. What we actually have in computer science is something we've, we've got used to, um, but nevertheless, maybe we should get a bit less used to it and a bit less accepting of it because it's a sort of divide or dichotomy. And I, I'm sort of, uh, to give it a, a sort of hopefully evocative name, I, I'm calling it the structure versus power divide. So on the structure side, we have compositionality, semantics, category theory, and the foundational issue that, uh, that's being uh, addressed is looking, is focusing on the complexity of computer systems and software and, and how can we achieve a structural understanding and understand how to put complex systems together. I mean, that's the sort of application which goes through into programming languages, formal methods, and so on. But at the foundational level, it's about the structure, uh, structural description of um, uh, computation. But then over on the other side, and actually started, if anything, by considerably more people uh, and, and more perceived from outside as, as what computer science is fundamentally about, is what I'm calling the power side of things, which focuses on issues of expressiveness and complexity and emphasizes how we can harness the power of computation and recognize its limits. And this is the arena, or certainly, of algorithms and complexity, but actually even within logic for computer science, for example, uh, that is what the focus of many people working in um, logic and automata, um, verification, um, and uh, um, databases, and other such things is. And the, the, so what I think should be regarded as a shocking fact, as I say people have got used to it, is that the current state of the art is that there are almost disjoint communities of researchers studying structure and power respectively with little or no common technical language or tools. In particular, on the power side, um, there's uh, virtually no use of uh, category theory. Often, indeed, it's regarded with considerable suspicion. And, well, it's my belief um, that this is a major obstacle to fundamental progress in computer science. That's only a belief. I mean, the, the only way to really confirm that is to sort of make some connections and see if they do lead to significant progress on some of the fundamental issues. So this is only an analogy, of course, but um, well, perhaps one can take inspiration from it. We had the, the Grothendieck program in algebraic geometry, the second half of the 20th century, where a great deal of category theory as we know it came from. 
And the very abstract tools developed there were ultimately critical for concrete results in number theory, such as the Wiles uh, proof of uh, Wiles Taylor proof of the, fir of the Fermat theorem and other results. And here's a, uh, a quote from uh, now number theorist Barry Mazur quoting another uh, number theorist and computer scientist Hendrik Lenstra uh, in a lectures uh, um, uh, in a conference uh, proceedings of lectures around the the Wiles proof. Uh, so Mazur quotes Lenstra saying that 20 years ago he was firm in his conviction that he did want to solve Diophantine equations and he did not wish to represent functors and now he's amused to discover himself representing functors in order to solve Diophantine equations. So maybe one day we'll, we'll get those complexity theorists. Uh, well, anyway, we'll see. So, and, and then on, the, on just on the general subject of uh, applied category theory, I mean, of course, we'd all subscribe, I, I, I expect, to the, this uh, statement here, powerful arguments for using category theory as the central technical language uh, to unify and relate different areas of study. It allows common structure to be recognized in what may seem to be completely different situations, and it has very powerful ways of articulating structure and proving results at the maximum level of generality. But we should also say that the weaknesses of category theory are also well known. The level of abstraction serves as a deterrent to many people and all too easily leads away from the deeper issues specific to a given area of application. Uh, it will so I think it's very important to combine the use of category theory with methods appropriate to the concrete problems we wish to address. And also, I think, very important to insist on aiming at results of real substance in some area that we do try to address within um, applied category theory. OK, so that enough by way of uh, generalities. Um, what I want to talk about here is um, a novel approach to relating categorical semantics, which is the structure side of things, to an area called finite model theory and its various offshoots and related areas in computer science, which exemplifies power. Now, I guess, I don't know um, if everyone is familiar with model theory and in particular finite model theory, but this is, we'll soon see what the, um, what the setting is, but this is a very widely used um, fragment of how logic is applied in computer science with applications in descriptive complexity, database theory, constraint satisfaction, uh, and various other things. So a first uh, piece of work on this was uh, uh, appeared last year in a paper with uh, Anuj Doha, who's uh, actually a um, leading finite model theorist um, and uh, one of his students. And then there's some uh, ongoing work with uh, Nihil Shah, uh, who did a master's dissertation with me uh, last year. And that's what we're going to be talking about. OK, I don't know how many people, how many people don't know what, mo uh, don't have no idea what model theory is? Just me. I can't be sure. Just you. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. <laughs> 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 well, never mind. I mean, well, so, so we, yeah, we don't need, but then you know first order logic. No? First order logic? Yeah, and or for all yeah. there exists. Yeah, OK. Okay. <laughs> uh, OK, so what's the setting? Um, so the setting is a structure that, 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 that is really uh, plays a central role in all the areas of computer science, all of which have both deep theory and lots of applications, um, databases, constraint satisfactions, uh, and isn't often studied in exact, I mean, we're, we're used to looking at algebras and similar situations, but so this is the level of generality of model theory. So we look at uh, a relational structure. So we have a vocabulary with some family of relation symbols, and relational structure is just a set and an interpretation of each of the relation symbols by a relation of the appropriate arity. And a homomorphism of such structures is just a function on the underlying sets which preserves all the relations in this obvious sense. So if you think of simple graphs, they're just the case where you have a single relation which is irreflexive and symmetric, 
and then the homomorphisms are the graph homomorphisms. Uh, or if you think of partial orders, then that would give you, and monotone maps, that would be another example. Uh, obviously, then these are subcategories of, uh, of the categories at question. So these notions are pervasive in a big chunk of logic known as model theory, which um, looks at the relationship between structures and the formal languages that describe them. Uh, and then in uh, computer science, we have relational databases or exactly structures of this kind, where the universe is finite. You have the tables, which are sets of tuples or relations in this sense, constraint satisfaction, and so on. And actually, this point of view has become very prominent in combinatorics. Um, the uh, book by uh, Hell and Nesetril on, um, shows that most of the considerations of combinatorics can be phrased, of, of graph theory in particular, can be phrased in terms of graphs and graph homomorphisms. Yeah, we're going to come to that. So the, 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 what takes the place of equations are formulas in logic. And then, so instead of having uh, varieties in the sense of universal algebra, equations between terms, we're going to have sentences and then the sets of structures that satisfy them. And we're exactly going to be concerned with that issue. Um, yeah, but that, that's exactly the... So... so, so, so um, uh, an equation that occurs in one of the, in the Chang and Kiesler book on model theory is that model theory equals universal algebra plus logic. So, um, yeah. Okay, so our setting is going to be uh, the category of relational structures and homomorphisms for some generic uh, vocabulary. Um, so it could be any, any vocabulary. Finite model theory means where you take the universes to be finite. So it's exactly the simple, and, and this is, um, so uh, as I say, if you think of graphs, then finite graphs. And, and from the point of view of uh, why it's important in uh, computer science, well, for databases, you would have finite tables. For constraint satisfaction, you would have finite domains. And also for talking about say, a decision, a property of graphs, a decision problem on graphs, if we're thinking of complexity theory, then we want a class, I mean, the, the, the class of things that satisfy the property you're trying to decide would be uh, a class of graphs that would be definable by some formula and some logic, typically. And then again, it would, you would have cons uh, restricted attention to the finite ones. So this has become a big area of study within uh, computer science. One of the interesting points about that is that the tools from classical infinite model theory, which was founded by Tarski essentially, uh, fail in the case of finite model theory, except, well, okay, so we'll, let's not get ahead of ourselves. So now we come on to model theory. Now, I, I like to uh, mildly tease model theory friends by saying model theory is about deception. In what sense? In model theory, we see a structure, and by now, and for now on, by structure, I mean relational structure of the kind we were just describing. So we see structures not uh, structure not as it really is, quotes, up to, in other words, up to isomorphism, but only up to definable properties. And what does definable mean? Well, it's obviously relative to a language, a logical language, in which you make the definition. So the crucial notion is equivalence of structures um, up to the equivalence induced by some given logic L. So we say that two structures are equivalent uh, if for every formula of the language, uh, the logical language, um, they, satis well, they satisfy exactly the same formulas. They satisfy exactly the same properties. So they're indiscernible by means of that logical language. Um, so this is, and it might be first order logic, for example, or it might be some fragment of first order logic or some extension with a more powerful language, say with fixed points or something like that. And this is fundamental in model theory. It's also become, uh, it's also a very standard notion in uh, computer science. Now, um, it's always true. Now, the other thing, as we were just saying, is that we're interested in defining classes of structures using 
formulas of a given language. So that might be used to define some decision problem or um, uh, in, uh, would it, would it, uh, or maybe a database schema or something like that. And it's, it's clear that if a class of structures is definable by a formula in the language, then the class must be saturated under this equivalence relation. And actually, in most cases of interest, particularly in finite model theory, the converse is true as well. So therefore, the crucial notion is this equivalence relation. And to be definable in the logic is to be a class saturated under this equivalence relation. Um, if a structure is in the class and another structure is equivalent to it, then the other structure is also in the class. Okay. <clears throat> and the way you would show that something is not definable, therefore, in such a language, uh, is to show that there are two structures which are indiscernible by this logic, and one of which is in the satisfies the property and the other one doesn't. So it gives you a method of uh, counterexample as well. So in descriptive complexity, we seek to characterize a complexity class as those classes of structures, for example, graphs, definable in the logic. So the classic result is the uh, Fagin's theorem, or Fagin, Fagin and the four Russians theorem, um, which says that the class NP is exactly uh, those things definable in existential second-order logic. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter for our purposes. And there, since then, there's been a large dictionary of such correspondences. Now, of course, definability in a logic means definability relative to a formal syntax of a formal language. And it's interesting to ask, and I think quite in the spirit of uh, the kinds of things we, maybe we do in this community, if, if this dependence on the syntax of a formal language is essential. It's actually a classic theme in model theory that one can give um, a syntax-independent definition of elementary equivalence. Equivalence by first-order logic, meaning the logic of and or not for all there exists. Uh, this is the kaiser shellac theorem, of course, for uh, um, infinite structures in general. And this becomes even more important in finite model theory, where um, model comparison games uh, play a central role. We'll sort of describe these things. But these are um, very well-known and widely used games in concurrency we have by simulation, which is part of a wider genre which includes